Okay, I'll call the uh, study session of the Newport Beach City Council for May 26, 2009 to order. Can we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Rosansky is absent. Okay, first item is current business, uh, clarification of items on the consent calendar. Councilwoman Daigle? I have none. Councilman Gardner? Nothing. Councilman Webb? I have none. Councilman Hen? I have none. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Curry? I have none. And I have none also. Uh, so we'll just go right into the budget review, Mr. City Manager. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you recall, the last study session, we gave a uh, overall picture of the budget macro look at the budget and we also reviewed the CIP projects that were being recommended by staff to the City Council and we also talked about pulling out some special issues that have budget ramifications that I thought that you might want to explore more thoroughly outside of just a department review process we did include uh, the PowerPoints if we did give a short uh, review of each department by the department director and I put that in there so if, if there are any uh, issues or any questions that you would like to hone in on, I'd prefer not to do that at this meeting, but let us know so that we can come back at the next uh, study session uh, with a presentation and maybe with some additional information. But it was my intent uh, this meeting to talk about those items that were on the list and to start out with the facilities financing plan. Uh, the uh, Council Budget Committee has uh, met on this uh, several times, but to me, it is probably the most important discussion that the City Council needs to have outside of uh, the normal budget process, because with a, uh, a new City Manager coming on in a few months, it, it is critical, I think, that you understand, at least as far as this plan, how it is projecting in terms of when projects are doable, and which projects appear to be doable and what the trade-offs are. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dennis and uh, Dick Kurth to run us through this huge uh, informational chart here known as the Facilities Financing Plan. Member, uh, mayor and members of the city council. This is about the facilities replacement plan. Uh, my presentation is 10 slides and reference to the little spreadsheet up there from time to time. Uh, if you would, Mr. Hen, might be easier to say thank you. What we're doing Before is, you get started, let me say one more thing. It, it, it's only 10 slides, but if this discussion takes 90 minutes or if it takes 120 minutes, you know, uh, that is immaterial as far as council going away from whatever this discussion time is feeling like it understands what the plan is and understands uh, and that it uh, comports with where the council wants the plan thank you Dick. Yes, sir as a reminder this is not part of the ongoing CIP plan that's uh, separate from that and above it really for a couple of reasons one is longer term two it deals only with general fund and three, it's confined to facilities. The emphasis is really on replacing aging facilities rather than on doing anything new, although some new ones do work their way in here primarily because they're part of, the, of that replacement process. Uh, as Homer mentioned, we've been through two meetings with the Finance Committee on this, uh, pretty detailed, and their uh, guidance and input are incorporated in what we're presenting this afternoon. The five topics I'm going to cover are what's the same as last year, what's different, uh, impact of the changes, uh, finally some conclusions and staff recommendations. The basic, what's the same as last year, it's really the same in three ways. The basic purpose of the plan, long term, and it has both a long term and short term focus. The basic purposes of the plan, essentially our marching orders when we put it together are number one, include all relevant revenues and expenditures for these projects so we don't have any surprises that we're not planning on. Uh, next, schedule the projects as quickly as possible, but don't commit more than 5% of projected general fund revenue to this pur for this purpose, uh, emphasizing uh, level funding, and finally, don't run out of money. Uh, the, here's how we do that is basically, and I realize nobody's going to be able to see these numbers, but here are the, here are the bottom of 
near the bottom of your handouts, well, what have I done? There we go. Too many buttons on here. I guess I do. This doesn't seem to work. Thanks. The gray line down here at the bottom of your handouts is very important and that that captures all the relevant revenues and expenditures. Revenues are things like the general fund contribution, development fees, which have become very important, proceeds of debt issue when we do them are all rolled into that, as are expenditures for actual construction costs, for debt service, anything that goes out. So as long as that gray line has a positive balance, we're okay. A second important line, one of the council's guidance to us was don't go over 5% of the general fund projected revenue. So there is a lighter colored line further down. It's, it's kind of a reddish on the bottom of this thing right here that shows what percentage of the general fund we're proposing to put in there each year. And it never goes over 5% because we don't let it go over 5%. We adjust other things. But So we have stayed within those guidelines. As I mentioned, it has both a long-term and short-term focus. The first glance for a lot of people when they look at this thing is, what's the point? It goes out 30 years. Everything's going to be different in 30 years. Why are we trying to project it that long? The primary reason for that is because we need to show that our future generations will not have to put more than 5% toward this program to keep it going, especially since we're leaving a, a debt service trail that goes out for quite a number of years. We don't want to, uh, for them to have to kick in more than we plan to do on the short term. Okay, that's all I've got on that one. What's different than last year is that uh, the format and structure of the form have changed quite a little bit. We also have scope and cost of band A and B projects have changed as have the, uh, as has the economic situation. I'll take these one at a time. First of all, with regard to the format structure, what you see here is the same thing that's on the upper left of the uh, upper left of the spreadsheet. Uh, and it's a breakdown of the projects. What's different this year than last year is primarily the top one, the Civic Center Complex. Last year at this time, that was just a city hall and parking structure. Now we've changed it to incorporate the broader concept of the library modification uh, and some of the park activity that was originally shown down below in parks has all been rolled up at the top, so it's a Civic Center Complex. We've also done a little bit of functional breakout in that excavation is a separate line primarily because things like that are the way we're going to see them when the bids come in. A lot of the numbers have changed on this, too. We'll talk about that later. The other change to format is near the bottom. There are several different line items dealing with the marina park that have been grouped all together. They used to be separate. Other than that, this part of it is the same as last year. Um, sure. The colors are not just to help keep you awake, although hopefully it will work in that regard. The colors tie to the bands that are coming in and the time frames which are going to be done. So as you work your way out this spreadsheet along the bottom, you'll see colors in these bands, which I'll mention in a minute, that relate to the projects back at the beginning. Easier to work with than the dotted lines. I mentioned project bands. That's the second thing that's changed since last year. And really we were kind of doing that, but we formalized it. And now we have, I think it's eight bands in there, seven bands. The first one which is, oh, well, this one's bad. The first ones to the left are the Oasis and Civic Center. Shortly on the heels of that, we have Sunset Ridge, Marina Park, and Lido Fire Station. Then bands C and D are primarily public safety projects. And you can see there's a pretty good time break between A and B right here and the time we get to the, to the rest of the projects. I'll talk more about that later. But the, the colors represent... We'll, we'll take you back to the titles over here, so when you see the numbers, you can relate back to them. And also, this is, this is the debt financing we're doing down in this part of the form, and the colors line up with that, too. So if you see some blue debt service payments, what's that for? You go back to this and see what project, what facility is, this, is that that's related to. Um, okay. The third thing that's different about the form now is that we have broken out these 
special development fees and other revenues that are coming in specifically for this program. They used to just be sort of mentioned in an oh, by the way, one-liner down at the bottom of the form. But uh, consistent with the Finance Committee's guidance, we've given that more detailed emphasis. It's a very important part of this. $51 million is what that amounts to now. Um, and I should say that that this development fee, all we've captured here are the ones that we know for sure. It's on the bottom of the form is where it's broken out, these green numbers down here. You notice it doesn't go out very far, with one exception, because this is as far as we've got them negotiated. We anticipate additional uh, fees along those lines, but unless there's something firm to base it on, we didn't include them here. So we're not, you know, we're not betting on the company. This is real money. We so, Dick, another way of saying that is the development agreements that we've already entered into are shown. Any that might be under exploration right now are not shown. Another point to make on these development fees is that the timing is really important, especially in the short run. I didn't talk much about the short run before when, when that slide was up. But we have a couple of crunches in the cash flow fairly early on in this program, and they're very dependent on the timing of our receipt of these development revenues. Uh, more on that later. Okay, so that's those are the things that are different about the basic form than what you saw last year. Um, other things that have changed since we reviewed this last year are the scope and cost of the projects, especially Band A and B, the early ones. The OASIS came in lower. That's, as I think everybody knows, that's great news. But the cost projection now for the overall A and B projects, especially the Civic Center, are up quite a bit. Uh, the scope was expanded quite a bit, and that's, so they're just higher. Um, the other thing that's changed is the economic situation. We are projecting lower revenues for a while, much to the surprise of probably no one. So what that means is that to stay within the 5% guideline that's available for this, the numbers become a little bit smaller on an ongoing basis. So it, it gets tighter. The, other, the flip side of the economic situation is that maybe we'll get lower project costs than what's projected here. That would be great. But for right now, we're going with what the estimates are that uh, the engineers project. Another point to mention is that, interestingly, there's the debt financing, the cost of debt for us, is relatively higher than it was last year. The numbers aren't higher, but in relation to what else is going on in the economy, they are. The actual interest rates are about the same as what we uh, were projecting before, but everything else has gone down, so it's relatively more costly for us to borrow money than it was last year. There are other factors with the economic change that will be mentioned later on, the potential activity by the state of California and how that may impact us, changing PERS rates, all of that will have, will make it more difficult, potentially make it more difficult for us to stay within our funding parameters. So the impact of these changes essentially is that the duration of the program got extended. What uh, used to be, as I mentioned, about a 15-year program is now more like 25 to 30. And the other impact is it's going to require increased contribution from the general fund above what we thought it would be last year to keep it going. To be specific, uh, last year at this time when we worked on this, everything was closer. We projected the general fund expenditure, the contributions about the level we thought we could. And then, oh, by the way, we'd look down at that percentage contribution line and see of how we're doing. And it was usually about 3.8 percent was as high as it got. This year, after incorporating the economic changes and the higher cost, started adjusting it up and up and up. And finally, we just did it backwards and set the general fund contribution at 4.93 percent, near the maximum, and then move the projects as, as early as we can without causing anything to go negative. And they're still out there a ways further than they were last year. Um, so that's where we are with that. Finally, with regard to conclusions, uh, we think the program is still doable within the parameters established, but it's going to go a little slower. And secondly, we are more vulnerable to things going wrong than we were for a few reasons. One, we're near the maximum on the general fund contributions. Uh, the economy is unstable. 
we're really banking on these development revenues coming in, and there's just just not a, a whole lot of uh, wiggle room, as they say. Staff's recommendations at this point are, number one, approve the current plan as scheduled, but consistent with the Finance Committee's guidance, reevaluate every six months or whenever significant information changes otherwise. Um, third, be mindful of point of no return financial thresholds. That's not to say we're not committed to the program. Everybody is. But the, when we're really committed is when we sign the contract or borrow the money, because then you've got to make the payments. So far, we've got a pretty good record of setting money aside ourselves to save up for this. But you cross the threshold when it's no longer optional, you have to make the payments. To give you an order of magnitude on that, uh, in 2011-12, right now, since I've been with the city, our debt service out of the general fund has been about $550,000 a year. Beginning in 2010-11, it will go to 6.5 million. And a couple of years after that, it'll go to 11.5 million. Um, before stepping off on those, we want to be sure that things are really going our way, especially in an uncertain economy. Just for order of magnitude, that 11.5 million is about the same as the total current salary and benefits budgets for the police traffic division, general services refuse collection division and the city attorney's office, all combined. Nobody's suggesting that we should double those operations. Maybe the police chief is. He's the only one here. But it gives you an idea that it's about the same amount of money it would take to double those. The last staff recommendation is that uh, because these projects are out a little ways, and the C and D are primarily public safety, there's only one public safety project in, uh, project in bands A and B. And they are aging. If we do get some flexibility here in funding, which we kind of anticipate, we're hope, hopeful with more development revenues and so on, that we, the council should seriously consider moving those projects forward rather than introducing something else in the interim to spend any extra money we might have. Uh, that's everything I have to say. I'll try to answer any questions you have. Okay. Any questions? Councilman Curry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I want to congratulate staff because this has been a very iterative process. The Finance Committee has had the opportunity to work with the uh, committee on some of the earlier iterations, uh, or work with staff on some of the earlier iterations of this plan, uh, provided some input, and I think uh, staff has taken that to heart and has come back with, a, with a, some excellent modifications. Uh, to Dick's point, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is an iterative plan, but it's also flexible and it also reflects changing reality on the ground. If you think about it, when this plan was originally conceived and City Hall was thought of as a $40 million project, uh, the fact that we're now in an economic uh, downturn and we're now talking about $100 plus million for City Hall, for the park, and for the uh, associated library improvements, $100 million, a 60 plus million dollar increase. The fact that this plan has absorbed that and demonstrated that we can uh, move forward and get it done shows its, tool, its, its versatility as a planning tool, and it also shows, I think, the financial strength of the city. Uh, I, I think kudos ought to be provided uh, to you, Mayor Selich, and to Councilman Rosansky, who have done such a great job over the past couple of years in negotiating the development agreements that have added $50 million in offsetting revenues that go directly to fund these projects and make it possible for us to stay on schedule with this ambitious plan. And without those, uh, we would not be having this, it would be a different conversation that we're having today. So I think that's one of the things that really needs to be recognized uh, first and foremost. Uh, this is a snapshot in time. And as, as Dick points out, it changes uh, every time somebody updates the numbers. So I'm not particularly disconcerted about projects that are shown to be in the out years because as our revenues increase, as we uh, execute more development fees, as we, as we deal with, uh, with other revenues, uh, we'll be able to make adjustments just as we have done uh, since 2006 to this plan relative to our capital projects. From a policy perspective, what this tells us is that even under this adverse economic situation that we have, uh, and even under diminished revenues, and even under ex ex substantially increased costs for City Hall, 
we are still able to keep on schedule and move forward with the next two projects in sequence, the next three projects, Oasis, which is under construction, uh, Sunset Ridge Park, and Marina Park. Because the, real, the only really policy choice that we have in looking at these numbers right now, whether we want to do this or not do it, is whether or not we want to delay Sunset Ridge Park and Marina Park, because those are the next two projects, and that's the practical impact of deciding that we want uh, uh, less allocation of funds to capital projects. And in fact, we've seen scenarios uh, that delay those projects uh, two years apiece, put, putting them out into the mid-decade of, of the next decade, mid part of the next decade. So I commend staff for figuring out how to keep those projects on schedule, how to get them done as they're originally conceived, which I think is a great accomplishment, and I commend the city staff for its management that's enabled, enabled us to be in this place, despite the downturn in revenues, uh, to take advantage of uh, the construction market to get the lower bids, such as we got on Oasis, uh, to move these projects forward. Uh, so job well done. Okay, Councilman Hen. Yeah, a couple of questions just for clarification. Uh, the amount of the general fund contribution ramps up in the first few years here. It, but it, does it, it ramps up to a level percentage of general fund revenue, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. And when does it hit that ramped up percentage? It gets as high as it's going to go in year 2016 on this iteration of the chart. As a percentage? As a percentage. Right. Okay. Um, After that, we assume that general fund revenue will increase and the percentage, the contribution will increase. So it, it ramps up to a, about 4.9 percent. Does that? 4.93 and then holds there. Yeah, and holds there. So we're, we're providing some runway, if you will, for the current economic circumstance that over time will rectify itself and allow for a more fulsome contribution from the general fund. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's an excellent question. That's exactly what we're doing. We're ramping it up faster than we were last year at this time, just because we needed to to get it up there with the numbers. And also, this year's contribution is not technically coming out of general fund operations. It's coming out of an appropriation surplus that's, that's there. Mm -hmm. So the change from this year to next in a downturn and over the next few years is pretty significant to build it. It's one thing to take an increase, future increase in revenues and program them toward this purpose. It's another thing to cut into current operations and move it that way. So we're trying to do this in a, in a graduated manner. Although in fairness, that operations reserve is quite a bit higher this year than it was last year. So there's That's what room to we'll do that, right. at least for now, right. anyway, without raising undue. Uh, we can do it for a year, but we can't keep it up. Yeah. We've got to find a way to take it out of operations. And so uh, also a separate question. Um, looking at the developer fee contributions, um, I've lost track of the, uh, there was the Santa Barbara condominium project, $5 million development agreement contribution that, unless I'm mistaken, I don't see it in here. Has that somehow gone away? Or that is a signed development agreement, is it not? <laughs> it is. <laughs> so the peanut gallery says no. <laughs> well, could perhaps perhaps the peanut gallery could come up and explain the status of that one for me. <laughs> Sorry for shouting from the back row there. Um, we have an approved memorandum of understanding with the property owner. Um, and an affordable housing implementation program. Um, and the MOU said that we would do a development agreement. Um, a draft has been prepared and, and both sides have looked at it and made comments. And then there was um, an effort to sell the property from one R to another group. And I think that sale was concluded, but the new owners have not made any progress on the development. <laughs>
Um, I've got, I've just talking about developer contributions. I've got another question on those, and that's on the Hyatt Newporter Development Agreement. The uh, you have the five million dollars coming in in 2013-14. What would uh, I, gu I guess my question is is kind of like the, uh, the the Lennar Development Agreement. I'm not getting a real feeling of comfort. They haven't signed the development agreement yet. I know that they've been asked to and haven't signed it, so I'm just getting a little bit nervous about it. So I'm wondering what the impact on this whole plan would be, because that's a that's more than uh, half of the uh, developer contributions coming in that year. What impact that would have on the plan if that didn't occur? Uh, serious. <laughs> the, you will notice that in 2011-12 is when the gray line reaches its low balance in the new term. And some of those other agreements. If, if any, which is the reason why I think in the short term we just need to review these things frequently, as, as Mr. Creep mentioned. Uh, the impact. I, we could certainly run a scenario that what if these weren't there? How much impact would it have? And bring that back to you. Wouldn't take I, long. I, I guess conversely, what would be the impact if some of the Irvine contributions, company contributions, were advanced more? What it would make it? life easier. Whether it would make it easier enough that we could move some of the distant projects a little sooner is unclear until we put the numbers in, but we could certainly try that. I should also say that with regard to these development revenues, wherever the agreement gives the uh, contributor a range of time in which to take certain steps, we assumed it would happen at the last possible day. So if they come in earlier, that will help us too. Yeah, I don't think your, your assumptions are flawed on when the money comes in. I'm just curious as what would happen if yeah. they did come in sooner. We could certainly run some alternate scenarios that would, would show the impact of that. Pretty Dick, easy to do. You know this a whole lot better than I, but it looks at 2016-17 uh, when we go up to the 4.93 for the first time, and then it remains there. Without that $5 million in 13-14, we probably get to that point a, a year sooner anyway. That would be one solution to it, would be to, to move to increase general fund contributions. But, you know, the variables are... General fund contributions and, and the timing of the projects are pretty much the things we yeah. can pull. Yeah, I mean, I would assume that by, I mean, we're talking about a contribution in uh, 2013 of $5 million, that by 2012, when we're going to do the second round of funding, COP funding, that we'd have a pretty good idea whether that $5 million is going to show up or not. Yes, sir, I would hope so. And, and so we, we could always just increase the amount of, we could. We'll Another significant funding. thing we'll know by that point is what the real cost for the Civic Center complex is going to be. Mm -hmm. when, we, you know, when we get closer to those kind of, the, the biggest things that will have an impact on this are the development revenues and the actual cost of the projects. And the closer we get to having perfect information in, the, in those areas, the easier it will be to do this. Yeah, but I guess my point is the $5 million, I mean, if we threw it in with the other $78 million that you're going to be borrowing is really another 5 or 6%. More money, right? More so money. If you're talking about payments, I mean, the payments are only going to go up five or six percent. Not, we're not going to be short five million dollars. I'm not sure I'm following. You. I'm saying that we're not going to be scrambling for five million dollars. I would imagine by the year before, we're going to know that the, whether we're going to have the five million or not have the five million, and then we could always increase the amount of the COP issuance to eighty-three million instead of seventy-eight million, which would increase our carrying cost, our annual interest payment, only. Five or six percent. In in some cases we can do that, and in some cases we can't. We're taking these contributions, just sort of putting them in the pot, and assuming we're going to borrow the full amount with the COPs that we can for the construction of the project. Right. So you can't automatically increase that to more than what the, the current project is worth to do that. One of the things we can do is is vary the year in which we issue the debt. If you'll notice that throughout this form, it usually tends to show us borrowing the money a year after the project starts because it's a little cheaper doing that in this in this climate. We could move it up a year if we need to. Mm -hmm. In the long run, it makes it a little more, a little easier, but. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Is everybody satisfied with the uh, order of priority? I think that's probably one of the big questions I think staff wants to know is that we've got our priorities correct. You know, I am satisfied with the order of priority. Uh, 
uh, although I recognize that we're going to need to replace the police uh, facility somewhere along the way, uh, it is a functioning, functional facility at the present time and probably will continue to be for a while, even though it's not ideal. And um, these park projects have been started and are well down the track, and uh, I would really hate for us to let up on the completion of those projects. And my guess is that we're going to have opportunities along the way to adjust our view of this up and down uh, as we get better information. For example, the cost of the city hall and park project is going to be known with pretty, pretty, to a pretty certain degree by the fall of 2010, as I recollect as the bids come through and whatnot. And that's, that is a critical decision point for proceeding with the parks. And so we'll have some, we'll have some better certainty about how all of this plays out at the point, at the next point we really need to make a critical decision, a go, no go decision on significant projects. Was, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. That's, you made that comment in the Finance Committee, and that's, we kind of incorporated that in here. Dates at which we, we, we need to be looking for this information and uh, produce revised versions of this when we get better information and bring it back to the Finance Committee or the Council is appropriate. And one other question. What, what is the interest rate assumed on the borrowings? First one is 5.15 percent, and we assume 5 percent thereafter. Who knows? But right now, that seems to be it, and, and our expert on the Council says 5.15 is about right. So that's that's the way it looks right now. And what's the impact of a, say, a half a point swing either either direction on the interest cost? For the first two, it would be fairly significant because they're going to be around longer and because they're happening right now. I, once again, we can run those alternate scenarios and, and show you. The impact of that is not nearly as significant as the impact of development revenue or the actual cost of the projects within normal parameters. We can certainly run some alternate scenarios and show you yeah. between 4.8 and 5.3 or something to see what kind of difference that makes. Now, is the on on City Hall, Marina Park, and Sunset Ridge Park is the sequencing shown in this plan? Is it all in uh, synchronization with our environmental documents and all the permitting we have to get from other agencies? Are we all synced up on that? I think based upon our best right. estimates right now, yes. Well, I'll just chime in here. I mean, for my money, uh, I, I think that at least the projects that we have going forward in the next five years are the appropriate projects. Um, you know, certainly we pushed out the next set of projects to 2018-2019, uh, and, you know, who knows between now and then, maybe we'll advance and maybe we won't. Um, I have confidence that although this is a deep recession that we will be seeing a recovery, the Newport Beach will always be at least in my lifetime and the foreseeable future, I think a great place to live. I think we'll enjoy healthy revenues and things like that in the future. And so, I, you know, as you say, it's a work in progress. We'll be updating it every six months or a year, however we do it. And I, I'm fully confident that even these projects that are stretched out in the future, we'll, we'll see them before. I think as far as the Civic Center project goes, that's something that's been in the making for 20, 30 years now. There's no stopping that train as far as I'm concerned. You know, this is the time to build it. Costs are low. A lot of uh, contractors are looking for work. And the faster we can get um, to the bid process, I think the better we'll be and the, the lower these numbers will be. You know, as far as the, the two parks go, Sunset Ridge and Marina Park, they both uh, fulfill um, unmet needs in West Newport. Uh, and again, Sunset Ridge Park has been in the planning stages well before I got on the council, 15 years, people 20 years have been working on that. And Marina Park, decades, I guess, you know, we've been talking about doing something there. So these projects are ripe and ready to go, and I think we have the ability and the resources to, to handle them. And I'm satisfied at least for the next 10 years that the, these are the appropriate projects. Any other comments? Just one more comment, Mr. Mayor. I think it's... It, it uh, you know is worth looking back, like say three years ago, maybe even four years ago, when we were talking about replacing City Hall right here on this side, and members of the community were saying, well, if you do that, does that mean that no other projects can be done? Because you're talking about a $50 million project. And what you're looking at here, it really came out of people asking that question. 
are we going to be able to afford those projects long term that we know that we need to replace? The city has just never had a plan before, and now we've had one for two plus years, and I think it is a terrific planning document that allows a lot of flexibility, but really gets down on one rather lengthy page, you know, all of the uh, interrelationships here and all of the factors that need to go in to do good planning, good facility planning when you're talking about projects that are sizably expensive. So I, I think the City Council has made tremendous progress in the last few years in terms of getting your arms around the projects and prioritizing them and saying how they can be affordable. Councilman Zasko, do you have something else? Councilman Hepp? Just a couple of more comments. You know, I want to make sure that the residents understand that this planning is taking place in the context of the annual budget that we are currently considering, which is going to be one of the toughest budgets in probably 10 years. And we hope uh, the toughest budget <laughs> that we're going to have to face, but maybe not. But in any event, uh, you know, we're going to be approving our view of this in light of current difficult uh, conditions and a balanced budget going forward for 2009-10. And secondly, uh, the city's credit rating today uh, is approximately a double-A credit rating from the rating agencies. And this plan, to the best of our ability to judge, would preserve that double A credit rating, which is a very strong credit rating. So we're, we're engaging in all of this planning with some pretty tight, pretty conservative restraints on how we're viewing all of this, despite the fact that the magnitude of the dollars is going up by comparison to our previous postures on these. Councilman Curry? And just to add to uh, Councilman Hinn's comments, because it's important to keep in mind what this plan is and what it is not. It's a snapshot and a testing vehicle for determining affordability. And what it has told us is that even with higher project costs for City Hall, and even with the reduced revenues because of the recession, uh, we are still able to keep those projects as, long, as well as Sunset Ridge Park and Marina Park on schedule uh, and still within the 5% limitation in terms of money uh, uh, spent out of, as percent of the general fund. Now, there are debt numbers in there. The debt numbers have changed every time this plan is put together. So for someone to say, for example, that this commits us to X amount of debt, it doesn't commit us to that at all. It commits us to getting those four projects in the sequence that we have scheduled, and the debt numbers are going to change every time we update the plan. It also uh, would not be a correct use of the plan to say that certain projects have been extended you know, far, far out, and that's when they're going to be done because, as we've seen, these projects move around. And as Councilman Hen said, I, and Councilman Rosansky, I fully anticipate that those projects will be built probably in a faster time frame as the economy improves and as we have the opportunities to do so. But uh, the important thing of what the plan tells us and the reason why it received the award from the League of Cities, it tests our affordability to undertake the projects that we have currently in the, in the, uh, in the shoot, and it tells us that indeed we are uh, fully able to do those and they are fully affordable. All right. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, the next items we have are also a couple of financial uh, issues that should not take very long. But the first one is uh, looking at the potential state borrowing of the property tax revenues. I think some of you just participated uh, just a little earlier with uh, Tony Cardenas as far as a, a little video shoot regarding um, something that can be put on the, the League's website in terms of uh, in opposition to the state borrowing property tax money from us. So, Dennis, do you have any new intelligence? Uh, or maybe that's the wrong word to use in this whole discussion yeah. <laughs> uh, based on what's happening in Sacramento. Uh, I really don't, City Manager uh, Blue Dow. As we mentioned when we did the uh, budget overview at the last study session, if, if the state imposes uh, Proposition 1A borrowing from local agencies, um, they can borrow up to $8 million. And if that's pro rata across all agencies that could contribute, that would mean approximately $5.8 million to the city of Newport Beach. However, uh, the 8% can be split up, to my understanding, can be split up differently. And 
it, more or less to the county, uh, less to the county, more to the city, so that number could even be larger. I did speak to somebody from the Lake California Cities, and I just want to emphasize that if if the 1A borrowing is imposed, it would take a two-thirds vote of the state legislature to do so, and the intelligence that uh, I heard was that that would be very difficult to get through the state legislature at this point. So it's it's a possibility. I don't want to downplay it at all, but at this point it, it would require state legislature approval of two-thirds vote. Two-thirds vote to do what exactly? To invoke the borrowing uh, uh, permitted by Proposition 1A. Okay, and then what about the uh, – it's the first time I've heard of this idea that uh, the county could pay less than the cities more. Does that – does that shift go weekly to all cities, or do they get to pick and choose uh, which cities would pay more? And I would think it would, would go to all cities. In other words, if, if they decided that the counties couldn't afford the 8 percent, they might say, okay, counties – and I'm, I'm, this is the best of my knowledge – counties, you contribute 5 percent, cities, you contribute more than the 8 percent. But every city would contribute the same percentage? To no my knowledge, yes. Person. Mayor Tim Curry? What interest rate would the state would pay us back at? I don't know. Uh, I would assume it was, you know, prevailing w uh, interest rate that uh, they could uh, get on borrowing funds or through their investment portfolio. So probably not much, right. to tell you the truth. I guess fortunately we're facing a situation that has never been faced before. So, you know, the questions and the devil is in the detail as to interest rate and when would that be paid and what if the state doesn't do it, what recourse is there? I don't think anybody has any answers for those kind of questions. So would they have to do this before we adopt the budget or, or do they get to do it any time? I think they can do it any time. They're, they're so well passed. <laughs> They've been working this whole year without really a uh, adopted budget that held together. So um, I don't know what the thinking is up there to do it quickly, or are they going to have a lot of debate on a lot of issues? Uh, uh, we, we have no clue. And, and historically, you know, at least for the past several years, the state doesn't have a good track record about adopting their budget on time. Let's really? it mildly. <laughs> Yeah, Councilman Gardner. I'd like a little bit of this conversation repeated at the council session tonight. I think probably more people watch the council meeting than the study sessions. And I think this is – our residents are reading about the potential property tax grab. And I think that if they know that it requires a two-thirds vote, they might want to start contacting some of their representatives and everything. So I think the more we can publicize this, the better. Okay. Any other comments or questions, staff, on this? Okay. Next. One of the things, another one of the things that I mentioned in our budget overview from the last study session was uh, the potential increase in PERS rates for the that we're facing, that every agency is facing, in fiscal year 2011-2012. And I just wanted to put some information on the board so that you'd understand the magnitude of that. Currently, uh, we've already got our, our PERS rates for 9, 10 fiscal year, which you will adopt in June. And so these rates that you see on the board are actual rates and the amounts that we would pay. What you see for fiscal year 10, 11, which is not the year that the large increase would uh, take into effect, you can see that uh, our rates are actually projected to go down slightly based upon uh, PERS results for uh, June 30, 2008. So safe uh, miscellaneous rates this year, 6.8 million next year, about the same amount. Safety rates this year, 12.5 million, about the same amount for the new year or for, or for the next fiscal year. Rates will go down slightly, but of course payroll based upon known MOUs will go up slightly. So rates won't change much from the proposed budget year 9-10 through 10-11. Dennis, can you help me with the acronyms there, the MPCER, -E, e et cetera? Sure. Um, well, you know, miscellaneous and safety, that's self-explanatory. EPMC stands for Employer Paid Member Contribution. In other words, the city at one point negotiated to pay 
purse per rates come in two um, two sides. There's an employer rate or the city rate, and then the employee rate that the employees should pay. Uh, at one point in time, the city negotiated to pick up both the employee rate for safety of nine percent and the uh, employee rate for miscellaneous seven percent. But as you recall, based upon um, um, a, a PERS has changed to 2.5 at 55, the City Council was willing to do so if the employee paid the difference, and that's the 3.42 percent that you see up here. So that's included in our rate of 18.15 percent, but there is no cost to the city. You can see a zero here and a zero here because that's picked up by the employee. So in the case of safety personnel, what this is telling us, though, is that they make no contribution to the pension plan. Is that That's correct? correct. Their rate is 9%, and they, of that 9%, right. they make no. And no it's work. all, their rate is all, their contribution is all paid by the city. Correct. Okay. Well, at the time that the city um, negotiated to pay the employee um, portion, it wasn't out of benevolence. That was a good decision at that time because the rates were low. Yeah, it was my understanding, Councilman Daigle, and that was way back in the mid '70s. With this, what the city chose to do at that time was there was a scheduled uh, salary increase due to the employees, and they said, well, "Don't give us employees negotiated with the city." Said, "Don't give us the salary increase; just pick up our portion of the of the uh, employee rate." And that seven percent, for instance, was picked up over two two fiscal years: three point five percent one year, and an additional three point five. The second year, same with the nine. It was 4.5 and 4.5. So it took the place of a otherwise uh, negotiated salary increase. Councilman Carter, did I hear you say uh, maybe two, uh, the last meeting, the last study session, that PERS was considering stretching out the increases so that they would be not have quite the impact. I know they've been doing leveling before, but they were going to do even more leveling looking at what was coming up, or was that just a myth? No, that's the next slide. Oh. <laughs> the PERS board uh, met on May 13th and gave first, first reading to a, uh, an ordinance of whatever they call it in Sacramento, but gave first reading to a proposal to uh, mitigate the impact of these uh, increases. And I know this is hard to read, but it, it, it might even look more difficult than what it is. But if you'll see that uh, this diamond is the current method, and so if you just follow the diamonds, that's what would happen to rates immediately. In, in the fiscal year 11, 12, they'd, they'd go from what this level up, they'd spike up to this level and remain there for a 30-year period. Also on this chart is a five-year smoothing uh, with, with no corridor. I won't even get into the corridor, but well, I, I will in a second. But this is what uh, uh, 37 Act counties normally do. And that's, that's this uh, line you see here. So it would go up much higher immediately, but then would come down sooner and, and remain low for a long period of time. They have 15-year smoothing with no corridor, and I'll, I will explain corridor in a minute, and that's this yellow line. And then finally, the square box is the proposed method, so it would go up much slower. It would get up to the point where it otherwise would have, go slightly higher for a few years, and then after uh, 15 years it would fall off and it would go this, uh, this method here. So what they're proposing, what, what corridor means is they, they want to see their uh, market value of assets stay between 80% 80, 80 and 120%. And what the proposal that they went to the board on May 13th was to allow the corridor to go to 140% the first year and then drop down to 130% the second year and then finally go back to 130% 100, and then finally go back to 120% in the third year. And that's what causes this uh, rate to stay about what it would otherwise would have been be slightly higher for the next 15 years or so and then drop off significantly. Again, this is only a proposal. Uh, it's based upon a lot of assumptions. It's assuming a minus 25 percent rate of return for this fiscal year. That return won't be known until sometime in September when they finally close their books. Um, 
it still requires second reading, and at the first reading, it only passed it passed by a vote of six to four, with uh, three members absent. They they assume even if those three members had been present, it would have passed. And it's really I listened to a conference call with a uh, Ron Sealing, who's the PERS chief actuary, and he said that uh, based upon another number of factors, that it was actually. Uh, a greater benefit to implement this uh, procedure to go outside the corridor for these two fiscal years because these are extraordinary losses and they shouldn't be absorbed in one fiscal year. They should be allowed to be uh, timed in and then over the life, the next 15 years or whatever <clears throat> that is, and then drop off uh, significantly. So he talked about the safety of the uh, PERS uh, system itself and he said that he would strongly recommend that uh, the board, the PERS board, adopt this uh, proposed method would, would allow the, the actuary to go outside their corridor again for two years and rather than being between 80 percent and 120 percent of market value, assets of market value, to go to 140 percent in one year, drop it to 130 percent the second year, and then go back to the 120 percent in years thereafter. Dennis, what concerns me about those numbers, though, it says a minus return in uh, 08, 09, and then thereafter it's business as usual as far as going to the old uh, estimate of what the positive return is going to be at 7.75, rather than a slow recovery as far as the uh, uh, economic downturn is concerned. I think that is uh, pretty optimistic. Well, Ron, Ron Seeley, somebody asked that question. Uh, Homer and, and Ron Sealing actually said that uh, historically, if you look over the last 50 years, 7.75 percent is very doable. Um, he, 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 there is, there are some uh, calls for that to be lowered to 7 percent or some other number, and he's pretty, uh, he strongly believes that it should remain at 7.75 percent based upon historical rates of return over the last 50 years. Well, maybe that's figured at losing 30 percent and then an increase of 7.75, you know, from, from, the, from the basic 70 percent of the prior value. So, you, you know, maybe that does make sense that way. I hadn't, hadn't thought of it. And again, when it says assuming a minus 25 percent rate of return, when you're uh, assuming you're going to make seven and three quarters or 7.75 percent and you lose minus 25 percent is actually a 32.75 percent loss for the year. And they are running a rate at 31 percent. The last number I heard for this current fiscal year, they're running at a 31 percent loss. But again, uh, the market's recovered slightly in the last few weeks and they won't know that final rate of return until sometime in September. Okay. Any so questions? it's Again, it's not a, a budget issue for you this year, but it's looming out there and something you should have to, you'll have to consider in the future. So I guess I'd like to put this in terms of dollars and not percentages. Dropping back to the prior chart where we're indicating in fiscal year 2010 spending about $19 million on these payments looks to me like the, the change in the payroll percentage is about a 50 percent change. Something in that range going from what looked like around 17 percent to around 24 percent or what was? Well, the, the rate of change actually uh, depends on payroll volatility, which I don't completely understand, but they gave some examples. Uh, well, well here's, here's where I'm headed, and so rather than me do the math, I'd like you to do the math. So if, if, if this proposed adopted solution takes place, the current $19 million contribution for the city would go to roughly what per year? Once, it's, once that smoothing or, or that delay factor is finished. Well, to answer your question, I, I think I can answer your question. Okay. If, if the PERS board does not adopt this uh, proposal. In 2011-12, based upon current information, our miscellaneous re rate would increase one point, almost $1.4 million, and our safety rate would increase 
approximately $4.8 million for a total of almost $6.2 million. That's in 11-12. In 12-13, in and it would have increased another 431000 in total, and 13-14, another 445000 However, if they do adopt this uh, proposal to, to allow the corridor to increase, in 2011-12, our miscellaneous rate would increase 182000 Our safety rate would increase 629000 for a total of 811000 in 1213, it would increase an additional 2.5 million, and in 1314, an increase of 3.5 million for a total of six point, almost 6.9 million over three years. So the, the increase would be the same. This proposal or not, it would just be you'd get there immediately in 2011-12, whereas if they adopted it, it would be spread out over three years, but you'd get to the same approximately the same. Uh, a seven million dollar increase by the time we get through this smoothing is a big, big dollar jump. Correct. Okay, any other questions, comments on the sun? Okay, next. In that case, the next, next item is lower bay dredging. I thought that this would be a good time to talk about you know, where we are to make sure that there is clarity on the issue. And since uh, now it appears that the lower bay dredging uh, has some money infused in it, I wanted to bring that issue to the city council and talk about it in relationship to the budget. Dave? Thank you, Homer, uh, Mr. Mayor, and council members. We'll go through a couple of quick slides on lower bay dredging. Uh, reminding you what the project uh, proposed would, would be. It would be to bring the lower bay back to its original design depth, and that depth varies between about uh, minus 10 and about minus 20. And that would remove about 1 to 1.4 million cubic yards of material. And note, as, you, as you've heard, that the cost is driven by the disposal location. The farther we have to take the material, the more complex the, the transit method, whether it's boat or barge or truck, that uh, literally drives the cost. So those disposal options include the uh, disposal site off the Newport Pier, about four miles off, called LA-3. That's for clean material. It doesn't contain high levels of sand. Another disposal option is for ocean beach nourishment. That's for clean material that is high in sand content. And finally, the most um, the stickiest point is a proposed confined aquatic disposal site or a CAD site or something like that which would take contaminated material that can't go to LA-3, and that quantity is undetermined, which is why the cost is challenging here. Um, the core, fortunately, uh, has, because they've gotten uh, some budget money, we'll talk about that in a second, thanks to, in large part, to your support, and especially Council Member Daigle's trip back to DC. Um, they'll oversee a private sector contractor doing this project via public bidding, and the project could start following an environmental document design engineering uh, and permitting of that CAD site if that's the route we go, and then official permitting of the dredging project itself, and that involves multiple agencies, including the Corps, the Regional Board, the Coastal Commission, National Marine Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and others, then a bid period, bid award, and then mobilization. So um, I won't go through this chart. I, I provided this for some of the residents and, and Council Member Daigle's discussions to compare why this is different from the Upper Bay. And the key thing is that um, the Upper Bay project is, is looked at by the Corps and by the city as a one-time project, actually one time in 20-plus years. The Lower Bay project is supposed to be an operations and maintenance activity, so it's supposed to be done routinely, even though it hasn't, most of the bay hasn't been dredged, dredged since it design, was designed 70-plus years ago. So here are the critical issues. No, number one, will the Corps be involved? And thank goodness the answer to that is yes. They've just received $1.78 million in the President's budget. It still needs to go through Congress. Um, there's an opportunity to add funds to it in Congress, and that's what we're working hard to do. Mayor Selich sent a number of letters to our congressional delegation asking for just that, that our priority project now be the Lower Bay and be adding funds to it so we can do as much as possible as soon as possible. 
The second critical issue is how much of that sediment can go out to LA3. We're doing the testing now to determine that. LA3 arguably is the cheapest disposal site for us. Permitting CEQA and NEPA, how long will it take? How can we expedite it? And then local impacts. Uh, siting of the confined aquatic disposal site is certainly something that uh, is sig of significant concern to the community. Uh, Councilmember Daigle and Councilmember Hen, along with Chris Miller and myself, were at the Lido Isle Yacht Club just last week talking about this with them because uh, one of the proposed CAD sites is right out there between Marina Park and, um, and Lido Isle. And then the, obviously the duration and scope of the dredging period and then how the actual CAD is constructed and then filled and then capped. So let's look at cost estimates. Um, and I have a chart after this so because this gets kind of confusing. We spent about 400000 to date on sediment testing and the CAD analysis. We expect that um, arguably the city's obligation in the coming fiscal year will be between five and $750,000, and that's the environmental work and the CAD design. Now, the Corps may be able to use some of that money to assist us with permitting and some of the uh, NEPA, which is equivalent to CEQA, analysis and possibly some construction money uh, carried over. The bigger obligation will come in 02, uh, sorry, 2010 through 2012, so two fiscal years. Uh, the CAD would need to be constructed. Um, the federal appropriation would need to be increased in this current year and then in the next year up to about $8 million. So, at, sorry, t $10 million total, meaning eight plus the about 1.78. Total project cost being about $15 million with about $4 million of that being the city's share, hopefully over three fiscal years, and $10 million from the federal government over two federal fiscal years. And know that our fiscal years are different, which is why that's a little bit confusing. So here's a chart that kind of shows when the money would be necessary and what fiscal year. These are our fiscal years versus the federal ones. And you can see the bottom line there, um, money spent uh, to date, money needed next year, and then the big chunk of money comes from the federal government, hopefully, uh, for the actual dredging project from the city for the CAD activity, leading to about a $15.1 million project. So with that. Uh, where's the, uh, where's the 5.5 coming from in 2010-2011? That is coming from our aggressive uh, advocacy efforts in D.C. to get the Congress and the President to uh, consider this an important obligation of the Corps. So the federal government. So that gets added to the one and a half then? That's right. Re remember um, that previous chart uh, way back here. Technically, the lower bay's dredging is a 100% funding obligation of the federal government, but they always have zeroed the project always until this year. This is the first year the president has ever included an amount in his budget. So previously, we've tried to add to that zero through Congress and haven't been successful. So this is the first year we actually have a number we can add to that's not zero. So, um, and the core seems very supportive of the project. The administration obviously is in this mode of getting projects delivered and getting projects done, getting people working. Uh, again, this is a private sector project that would be done by a private sector dredger. Can you comment on where you think the kind of the stimulus funding is going? Uh, obviously, we see the stimulus funding going to the Upper Bay, and that would complete that Upper Bay project with the remaining 17 or so million, and that's become about a $48 million project. The timing of that is very important because we could dredge the Lower Bay, not have the Upper Bay done, so this is the bad scenario, which isn't going to happen, dredge the Lower Bay, not have the Upper Bay done, and the Upper, Bay's pro the upper Bay project designs and builds two huge sediment capping, sediment capacity facilities that allow a big storm to send that sediment into the upper bay and hold and stay so that it doesn't overwhelm the lower bay. So we really don't want to do the lower bay dredging project until the upper bay project is done in terms of those sediment basins, which is why the timing is perfect for the stimulus package being associated with the upper bay and then the congressional appropriation process through the FY10 budget for the lower bay. So we're hoping there might be a second round of stimulus that would sort of have the timing of when our 
Lower Bay project is um, shovel ready? That's true too. There's much discussion in D.C. about doing another stimulus bill outside of the federal appropriations process and then they'll be looking for the same kind of thing, shovel-ready projects. That, a lot of that will depend, obviously, on the state of the economy. I don't think the federal government wants to spend that money if it sees the economy uh, coming back as it might be. Well, Dave, has there been any talk with the Army Corps then since uh, how they're going to use the one point, is it 1.7 million for the lower bay? We have a uh, discussion this week on that, a staff level discussion. So. W w the only thing we heard from last week was, um, hey, the money's in the president's budget, so now we'll start to flesh out how that, that should best be used, as well as making sure we and the Corps are on the same page and strategizing how much more money, more money they could receive in FY10 through the congressional ad process, the add-on process, because we think they could probably accommodate, as noted in this chart here, they could probably accommodate $7 million in their um, FY2010 budget. And one more question. I mean, if we have money in this project, does that require CEQA or is it going to be a NEPA? Uh, that, that's a good question and one I don't have the answer to. We, we probably, if we're taking on the lead, we'll, we'll likely have to do the uh, CEQA process. The NEPA is an additional layer that comes in whenever the Corps does the project. I know, David, you seem interested, so if you have a... And it's often done as a joint document, EIR, EIS, and it's generally done in that fashion, so it satisfies both federal and state law. How does the um, Rhine Channel play into this whole thing? I guess I guess the thing that comes to my mind is if we're doing these CAD sites and we have all that contaminated material in that channel, why aren't we just doing a bigger hole or a bigger series of hole and taking care of that at the same time? We're going to be analyzing that, uh, the issue of the size of the CAD associated with what might be needed for the Rhine Channel at the same time. So um, I've given you the portrait of how it looks with lower bays contaminated material. We may want to increase the size of the CAD to accommodate the Rhine Channel's material. It, it's it's not, um, not all that challenging to build another cell right next to the existing, sorry, the CAD that we'd be building, add another cell if we think that's the right tool for the Rhine Channel sedimentation. But we're looking at that fairly aggressively. I didn't present any of that to you because it's still, it's more uncertain in terms of the quantity of materials there. Our timing is a little uh, less intensive on that because the regional board has given us a period of time to address that, but that period of time will, uh, they'll, they'll start to get impatient with us and ask us when. It's probably three to four years. Do you have any idea of how deep and how big area-wise the cell or cells we, we would, don't. Would, would be. We don't, but we'll know that soon. Uh, the folks who are doing the testing uh, will be able to give us a, a much finer diagram of what that CAD might be probably within about two months. We'll be able to come back I'm, to I'm, you. I'm trying to visualize this thing. What about the ones that have been done? How, how yeah. big were they like that one in uh, was it Port, in Wainimi? Port Wainimi? I don't know. Chris, do you have any thoughts on that size-wise? Um, it'd probably be a few hundred feet. Um, uh, in either direction, depth would probably be somewhere on the order of minus 35, minus 50, minus 55 feet deep, depending on slopes of the walls and, and or the sides and um, how it engineers out. And of course, we won't know those. We won't know those, the, those dimensions that I just mentioned until we get a final quantity on um, how much needs to be disposed. It, it could. We have low numbers and we have high numbers, but in, but until about three more months, two or three more months goes by. It's hard to design a hole for a software quantity that we don't know what it is yet. Um, very good question on the Rhine Channel, and I think that I think that's something we really need to try to bring in. There's a lot of tenants in that area that I think would really appreciate um, the availability of disposal, you know, for the dredging that they need to have done. Yeah, for the for the Rhine, we're looking at about 100,000 cubic yards, just to give an idea of the scope. Councilman Head, you have a question? Yeah, a few, a few questions. Uh, the timeline on this cost estimate chart, those are city fiscal years? They are. Remember, the federal year starts in, uh, in the 1st of October, so right. it lags by three months. Not too much different. So roughly by uh, June 30th of 2012, we would hope to be done with the lower bay dredging according to this timeline. 
Uh, yes, and, and w now if, if you're asking Excluding about a precise yeah. date, the, it, I, I talked about just an allocation of dollars. There may be a contract let within that period, and it may extend a little longer than that. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about the $17 million for the upper bay and the $1.78 million for the lower bay like it's money in the bank. I just want to make sure I understand this. The $17 million of stimulus money has been approved and in effect could, would not be, it's not subject to rescission in the congressional decision making process. That's correct. The $17 million. That's correct. What about the $1.78 million? That is, is not, sorry. Is sure. it subject to rescission? You talked about adding to it, but is the 1.78 possibly subject to rescission or cut? There is always the chance that Congress could zero uh, an amount that the President has submitted. However, um, the folks in Washington will say there's a 99.9% .9 chance that won't happen. Uh, what usually happens is, it, especially in this Congress, uh, with, with the majorities that are there, they'll add to it. And then a, a, a final question for you, and then I would like to make one quick comment. The, the, uh, of course, this is all very important, very necessary work that needs to be done, and we hope it will get done sometime not too long from now. But then there's maintenance after that, right? So somebody is going to have to... Um, dredge out those catch basins in the upper bay every so often, right? That's not a federal obligation, an ongoing federal obligation. That's correct. Okay. And then for the lower bay, probably there's going to have to be maintenance dredging year after year or every so many years, whatever, to sort of keep it tuned up to the design depth. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. And right now, that technically is a continuing federal obligation, although we've seen how much success we've had getting that money. Um, has there been any discussion about the funding of ongoing maintenance and who might have to fund that in the lower bay well, and the upper bay? Let me jump back to the upper bay first. Um, your council did set aside what's called the Robinson-Skinner annuity. You have about $3.9 million in the bank for the next upper bay project. It's dedicated to that. Now, you, you just heard that's a $48 million project, and 20 years from now, that may be twice as much. But the other thing that happens with the upper bay, too, is the city, again, thanks to your budget, we also pay um, uh, roughly, I think it was to say about $200,000 a year to keep the sediment where it's supposed to be, which is up in the hills, up in the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains, in the catch basins right in front of UCI. Those are sediment control facilities too. We pay, you're, you're, the taxpayers of Newport Beach paid it to uh, clean that out. So, so a couple of answers. There's a strategy to reduce the sediment coming in. There's money set aside to do the next Upper Bay project. And then jumping to the Lower Bay, um, you, we have seen that the bay got into this state over 70 plus years. As long as we manage the sediment basin upstream, sediment basins upstream correctly, uh, there will be a need for lower bay dredging on, a, on an ongoing basis. But my guess is it may not be as significant as we suspect it might be, provided again that that sediment is maintained upstream. Now, you're correct that the we will argue with, or sorry, we will advocate before Congress to get a long-term funding source for that. I also think we will want to consider a local funding source for it, uh, dedicating a certain revenue stream to a small dredging project every year, whatever that might be, to knock off the shoal wing. So it is definitely something to plan for in the budget. Okay. Uh, last comment is that uh, the current um, preferred site for the CAD is right between Lido Isle and Balboa Peninsula. And uh, so we are all very interested in exactly what the dimensions of this CAD site are and what the operational impacts are. And uh, we've started having some discussions with our residents about that, but we're going to want to have some very careful discussions about that once we have better information and can uh, provide real facts about the initial impacts and the ongoing impacts of this project. And so we we'll certainly want to do more outreach as it relates to that. And uh, 
I know you're aware of that. Well, we'll and, take it. Uh, we just need to really make sure about that. The, the, the residents are going to want to have questions asked, answered about not just what the impacts are, but what the alternatives were and why the city might conclude that this is the best single alternative for the location of the cab. So we just need to make sure we can answer those questions well along the way. Okay. Um, I just had one question. It, you know, you, you, you get this Lower Bay project done, you get the Rhine Channel done, outside of people dredging around their docks, or there's, is there any other dredging in the Lower Bay that's going to need to be done? Or have we done it? Well, we're, we're gosh, we've pretty much tackled everything at that point. Then, then I think we, we will grapple with our ongoing problems of eelgrass and making sure that, that the newly dredged Lower Bay accommodates eelgrass to a level that doesn't impact the people who want to dredge beneath their docks. Remember, too, we have a couple of um, at portions of the harbor that are not in the public tidelands, and that is, say, around Dover Shores. Um, those, that, those are private waters. The area on the inside of Linda Isle is, are private waters. So there'll be a, hopefully a, an impetus in those communities to maybe tag team onto the larger project to accomplish that dredging. But overall, I think once we get that handled, the lower bay, the Rhine Channel, the upper bay, I think then we're, pro we're pretty much in maintenance mode. And then we'll, it doesn't mean though we don't have to tackle the other TMDLs that are out there, the nutrients, fecal coliform. And um, what's the one I'm missing? Toxic pollutants. Okay. Well, I guess I, I guess what I'm getting at are there areas that are outside of the boundary of our dredging project, and not within the area that private homeowners or property owners would be dredging that are going to need dredging in the future at some Can I time. Answer that, Chris. Yeah. Well. Most, most areas of the harbor are, are covered. There are areas uh, around uh, Linda Isle that um, are county-owned, private-owned, and city-owned. And um, we're going to work with um, those communities in the county to um, tack that project onto our um, current larger project. There's also Promontory Bay, which um, um, hasn't been we haven't had any signs of uh, significant shoaling um, that we're aware of. Um, that could be something that uh, we could look at later on. There's also West Newport, which um, has some very narrow channels. I, I consider West Newport area around Newport Island. And um, that area um, does have, it, it could use some dredging in the future, albeit it's not their, their concerns and their needs aren't as immediate as the other Lower Bay um, areas. But that's something that um, I've prepared a um, kind of a, a, a budget timeline um, for the finance committee. I'm not sure if you've received it yet, but it kind of sh it kind of shows out much like this uh, chart does uh, in different colors um, where what what I project uh, this harbor will need as far as maintenance and what areas and some different projects. And and I do address what I just said. So do we know how many yards are in all those little areas? No, we haven't. We haven't looked at any of those areas. Although we we, we will be looking at the um, at the area around Linda Isle, um, um, but uh, no, we haven't even looked at the other areas that I mentioned. And um, I might just say, on top of what Dave just said, that um, uh, Linda Isle is uh, currently the currently investigating um, the feasibility of dredging the inside of Linda Isle in the inner lagoon there. And Dave's correct. They hopefully will be um, piggybacking on, on the projects uh, or, the, or the contractor who's currently on board here. And also Dover Shores will be um, dredging their community um, probably in the fall time. So. Okay. Well, it sounds like there could be some additional significant dredging there. And yeah, add all those little areas up. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah Councilman Dave. Um, one thing we talked about on our Bay Issues Committee um, was to have an event maybe at the Moose Center um, to recognize our congressional delegation. And some of these representatives are not even within our district and they're willing to help Newport Beach. And I know Colonel Magnus would also be appreciative of that. You know, it's a very significant civil works project. Okay, any other comments, questions? Okay, next item. Mr. Mayor, the next item is uh, talking about 
water rates and our need to uh, adjust water rates, I think this is probably the second biggest, if, if not the, the biggest, along with the facility financing plan that we need to spend some time on. This issue has uh, come before the uh, uh, Council uh, Finance Committee on a couple of occasions. And uh, so the um, thinking here is, uh, has come from that committee based upon uh, some questions and some detail that we have provided. But this is going to take a, uh, a little amount of time in order to make sure that the rest of the council people have the background that they need in order to um, deal with this issue. George. Well, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, as Homer said, we, we've spent about a little bit over a year looking at our water rate study. And uh, you've no doubt uh, heard on the media about a water shortage here in Southern California. And so it's almost like a perfect storm for us. We have a, a lack of rainfall. We have uh, a shortage from Northern California. We're also doing our, our water rate study. So I kind of compiled all this into a quick 15 to 20 slide presentation. And hopefully we can get through it fairly quick. So please just stop me along the way. Uh, we're going to jump around, but I thought I'd bring you up to date on these topics. One is, what is the current issue? Why am I here talking about water rates? Um, the history, so what has the city done so far? Uh, and as Homer mentioned, we've been to the Finance Committee a couple of times, and we really appreciated the input from them, and we looked and researched some of the, the questions that they had. And then the study results, that's the rate study that the council actually uh, directed us to, to do in February of 2008. Um, so we have the results of that. Um, we can get into detail on that. Again, that's about a year-long study, and we, we covered turnover every stone. Um, but we pretty much put the highlights into this presentation just to kind of streamline it for you, but please uh, ask any questions. And then future actions. What does it take when you talk about water rates? If you want to change rates, uh, it's a little bit different than the last time we raised the rates in 2005, so I, I have a couple slides on that. Okay, so the current issue is really basic as far as water rates. Our revenue doesn't meet our expenditures. In fiscal year 8, 9, and fiscal year 9, 10, uh, this year, once again, um, our revenue, the money that we're collecting for the sale of water, just doesn't meet our expenditures. Expenditures are the, the biggest cost increase that we're seeing is our cost of water, what it costs the city of Newport Beach to bring water into Newport Beach. Uh, as most people know, there's no natural source of water here in Newport. There's only two sources of water, and that's the import sources, which is from the Colorado River in Northern California. And then our groundwater sources, which is purchased water from our wells, uh, we actually pump water uh, 10 miles into the city limits from Fountain Valley with our four city-owned wells. So um, we actually need to purchase all that water to bring it into our, our customers. And so it's that cost that's really driving off, uh, going up pretty high, and I'll show you in the next few slides. George, what are our annual revenues? Our annual, right now we're collecting about $17 million dollars. In, in just the water sales, and that's including the fixed fees and the uh, meter charges and the fire hydrant and services. So we collect about $17 million. So we're about 20% under? So. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, we get interest income on any of the reserves that are in there, plus, um, but uh, we actually detail it out in the next couple of slides. Um, the reserve policies, um, those are the current um, reserves, F2 reserve policies for. Um, we have 35% of our operations is for a stabilization uh, or infrastructure charge or infrastructure reserve. And then 25% of our operations is set aside just for rate stabilization. And the thought I think initially when they designed this was that you would raise the rate one year, wait two or three years, and, and as their cost increased, we wouldn't have to raise the rates every year. We would just wait four or five years and we'd raise the rates again. So it was a rate stabilization reserve. And uh, the Finance Committee actually has guided us to look at that reserve, and uh, with the help of admin services, we actually have a proposal uh, to, to straighten out those reserves. How much is on the reserve now? Right now we have about $8 million left in the reserve, uh, and we'll need uh, later in another slide. The $3.5 million is what we'll need just this year to take out of reserves uh, to balance it. Um, the, 400, the $4 million is what the target, it's $4 million under what the target level should be into those reserves. Now, one thing that just, uh, we talked about this at the last uh, meeting that you had, was that, that we had about <clears throat> $2.8 million set aside to do the Babel Island work. So it looks like we may not have to do that, so that'll actually help out. And that's not uh, in this presentation. Um, so we still earmark the money knowing that we would go and do that infrastructure re repair in the future, but it won't be for this year. So. 
The 3.5 you see there includes that two and a half million dollars for that Babel Island work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then and the two biggest things really is the cost of water is increasing, and you'll see them. Uh, that's the cost the, the, we pay for water to bring into Newport, and then the water supply is decreasing, which I mentioned earlier. Um, is you'll see from Northern California how it affects us. Okay, some history behind it on water rates, just to bring everybody up to speed. The last rate increase in the city of Newport Beach was 2005. Um, the water cost of you know, it's MODOC, which is the Municipal Water District of Orange County, and MET. This is where we get our imported supplies. These are the folks that are bringing water from Cal uh, Northern California and Colorado. Um, <clears throat> since 2005, that cost only increased 5% up to the current year. But you can see after this year, and later I'll, I'll give you the numbers, but up until 2014, it's expected to increase 120% if we did nothing since 2005. We're looking at a 40% increase for imported water this year, and really that's it because of the delta and the, the issues up in Northern California. <coughs> OCWD, the Orange County Water District, is, are the people that manage our basin. The pumping percentage this year will decrease by 7%. That's the amount of water that our, of our demand that we pump. So um, this year is 7%. Last year it's falling. We have dropped 5%. So this year is set at 62% of our demand can be pumped from the groundwater. And, and the groundwater is important. Um, it was constructed in 1996, 97. It's because it's about $100 or $200 an acre foot cheaper, so it's, it's more cost effective to pump that. But as that basin drops, um, what they do is they reduce the amount of water you can take out. The bad part about that is it makes you more dependent on the MET, Metropolitan Water District. And as you see, those are the costs that are expected to go up 120% in the next five years. Um, the, the cost, that should say expected um, to the cost increase uh, for the OCWD water, um, groundwater supply cost increase are 38% since 2005. Um, we see that until 2014 uh, it will be an overall 58%. So we don't see that huge climb in there, but we're projecting, of course, an increase, but not like our import supplies. Now here is, uh, this is the history really on the water supply, and this is where, why costs are, so why are they going up? Um, if I understand it correctly, and I've looked at all these charts, the, the finance committee, that you, you can distill this, though, to within this overall increase, mm -hmm. that 52% can be attributed to water supply, but there's still 48% salaries and benefits Correct. and these kinds of things. So I know I'm not convinced of the, that the full increase is necessary. The, currently what we, what we had anticipated is, you're right, not only salary and benefits, but also that we're under the reserves. We've been drawing out a reserve since 2005, and so we don't meet the target levels that the council has adopted. So in order to reestablish re or put the money back in to meet the council policy, we would have to increase greater than what our expenditures or salary costs would be. Okay. And where does the 6% interest on the tax dollar come in? in terms of replenishing those reserves, or how did that come I'm up? I'm sorry, what's the 6%? When we had discussed it at the Finance Committee that also within the rate increase is a proposed 6% loan on general fund dollars. Well, this was because of a couple of things we've done since then, and I'll jump into those, those slides in a minute. But the, the CIP that was needed for this year, the expenditures, and how much we would need just, the idea was, and the guidance we got from the Finance Committee, is that there is a full 40% increase from MET, so, and I know we don't get 100% of our water from MET. But rather than hit the rate payers with a 20, 30% increase, is that we got the guidance from the Finance Committee that we would increase it maybe 10% over the next few years. In order to do that, we would need to actually borrow from the general fund or issue debt and then draw off reserves so, that, so we could see a, a smaller gradual increase. The idea that I got from the Finance Committee was this is a poor economic year, Let's not hit the residents with a big 20%, 30% increase to reestablish the policy of refilling 3 or $4 million in the first year. Let's, let's fill the, the, the pool or the bucket over the next few years and also increase the rate over the next few years. So in order to do that, we threw that into our rate model, and we just said, well, we'll go up 10% every year. And um, we, in order to have to do that, we'd have to borrow money, put it in the bank so we could pay for the water. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the, the, why the MET is going up. Um, you probably see on the news and in the media, you've seen these pictures. The picture in the lower left is the Orville uh, Reservoir. It's at 50% capacity. And not all the reservoirs are exactly 50%. Some are 30 and some are 60. 
But you can see in Northern California, most of their reservoirs are going dry. Those are actually houseboats and, and docks that are down in the, the little channel. The little guy on the lower right, he's the Delta smelt. There was a court decision in 2008 that, that he's on the endangered species, and so uh, a court ordered um, that the Metropolitan Water District had to reduce their pumping from the Delta. And so that reduced in 2008 30% reduction of water from Northern California to the Southern California. Um, there's two other uh, species. There's one other species of smelt and also a salmon who uh, they're considering to put on the endangered species list, which could increase that 30% to a 50% reduction in 2009. So that's why you see the Metropolitan Water District. Um, they, they just plain can't fill those reservoirs. So we're also going on a third year consecutive year of um, below uh, average rainfall. So there's also a weather drought on top of that. So again, all these things <coughs> combined, uh, you see that um, Metropolitan Water District use their reserves. They have a lot of fixed fees for costs, purchase water from other sources in Northern California. So they've deple depleted their reserves. And so a combination of all that, the Metropolitan Water District will increase their rates by 40% this year, 20% in September and another 20% in January. So in addition to that, the Metropolitan Water District, MWD Board, adopted an allocation plan for all agencies that they serve water to. So yes, us included, for the portion of water that comes from the import sources, we must reduce by 15%. Now that affects every agency a little bit different, and we um, talked a little bit about this at the Coastal Bay Water Quality Meeting, is that um, if you had rec reclaimed water in, in your city and you were doing conservation efforts, you were given credits. Again, that's 50%, 15% of the water needed from, in, from our import sources. As I said earlier, the city of Newport Beach, 62% comes from groundwater, so that leaves with 38% from there. Bottom line, citywide, we're looking at about a 6% reduction, and the city, the residents are doing really well. Uh, they're reducing currently just with our current conservation rates. We just need to do just a little bit more. But if you don't reduce, the penalties will about be about twice the rate. So we're looking at about $1,400 an acre foot for the penalties. So that's kind of the, the bad part of that. But luckily, we, are, we do have the groundwater um, that we can rely on. OK, um, back in history here, the council directs staff to conduct a rate study and conservation rate um, structure feasibility. This is back in early 2008. Uh, rate study needed to be performed in order to raise the rates. Um, it's great direction. Conservation rate structure was really looking at tiered rates. I think that came after uh, the grand jury report of May 2008 for water um, budgets, not water rationing. And so we got staff was directed to, to look at both of those. So we hired uh, Red Oak Consulting. <clears throat> um, they're part of the Malcolm Perney group. And they started the, they concluded the rate study uh, of the first, we broke it apart in two phases. The first phase is con concluded, and that's really the comprehensive fi five year financial plan. And we thought it'd be best really to just look at our finances, revenues and expenditures, and balance the budget first, and then go into the rate structure feasibility. When we started bumping the tiered rates and the cost together, everybody was a little bit confused about how we're gonna collect the run revenue uh, by changing the whole structure. So we broke it apart in two phases. Uh, the Public Works updated the math water master plan. Uh, we just had to update some numbers. That became important on the, on the actual five-year financial plan because we didn't know how much money we were putting out there for, for infrastructure. Again, earlier, like you had mentioned, uh, the Babel Island um, was another one that was scheduled to do for the underground district. So we had to look at what are those real costs over the next five to 10 years. Um, and then, again, we went to this, the uh, Finance Committee on March 20th and, and April 24th and talked about the details of the financial plan. So here are the numbers. <coughs> This year, um, in fiscal year, we well, can see we're in um, 07-08, we're at $597 an acre foot for the import su supply. Um, and then next year, we're looking at uh, 629. The, this fiscal year, 910 coming up, this is where you see the big jump. It's $741 an acre foot. It's, it's a large, largest increase we've ever seen. And then we have projections that go all the way out to 2013. The OCWD is our groundwater um, costs. Uh, that's the pumping cost. And all these include all the variable charges, um, but you see that it's, it's going up, not as high as the import, but really the driver is the import. And at the bottom is really the, uh, the average between the two. And this includes that basin pumping percentage, how much water we get from ground and how much we get from import. And so as you see, the rate just keeps uh, increasing there. 
Uh, from, from our study, we have our expenditures, and this looked at operation and maintenance. We broke apart the, mo the uh, import and the groundwater costs. The existing debt service is important to, to note there. That was our, the uh, bond that we had for the groundwater project that was constructed in 96, and that will be paid off. It's down to $100,000 this year. And so that's kind of saving us. Um, we don't – that will be paid off this year. So you can see that our total O&M um, actually is not increasing that much if you include the cost of water. So the bottom line on the, in the CIP um, is in there, the $4 million for fiscal year 09 was included in Babel Island and also some rollover from the previous year. Um, but those are the actual costs that we expect to spend in the next five years. So you can see we need about $22 million um, to operate um, this year. And then it will go to 22. You see a little decrease there, and that's really because of that CIP. And I think that CIP is going to change based on what we do with the Babel Island project. Uh, George, on that point. <clears throat> sure. Um, I, I know that uh, when we were contemplating the assessment district, we pulled forward the water uh, replacement uh, work that was going to be done, assuming that it's not going to be done right. um, now. What would be the natural time frame that that would fall in where it ought to get done? Well, there is, was is it in this time horizon or somewhere on beyond that? These are the old numbers. and, and we initially, for the Babel Island, there was some large um, distribution made we wanted to do down, down Park Avenue. It was scheduled in the next couple of years. We did some additional work because we were tearing, tearing up the alleys for the undergrounding and there was some sewer work. And so we took that opportunity to push some projects that were maybe 10 years out and some of them were 15 or 20 years out. We pushed them all up because we had the alley torn apart. So now what we need to do is redistribute those over the next 20 years. I think there will be a, maybe a small portion if there is an opportunity. But then we have to realize uh, construction costs are low now, so there might be an opportunity to do some repairs. But I think that we'll just have to redistribute that money, and I have not put that in the plan. Unfortunately, we, we had to move forward. We did our CIP master plan. We did our projections. The plans are ready to go, so in the event that it did pass, we could be ready to go, shovel ready, and do the work. Uh, and as you know, it didn't work out that way, so now we have to yeah. rescatter those projects out. But, but for the planning horizon here, the, the water supply quality and reliability for Balboa Island is not at risk it's not because of the failure. Okay. No, we've actually had a very aggressive, I, I'm really proud of the way the city has done that. We've had a very aggressive CIP replacement for cast iron mains and infrastructures. The groundwater project uh, to bring well water in was a great investment. The reservoir cover of 2004 was a great investment. Um, the CIP has been uh, very good and on schedule, and I think we just need to anticipate. Um, for instance, when I first started here, we had redwood mains. There was actually we uncovered a water main that was made of redwood redwood pipe, and so you know it still worked, but it's only a matter of time when the ground shake is not going to work. So, um, you know, really all that's gone. The cast iron's nearly gone. Um, so we've gone through, and it's been – Public Works has done a great job in, in keeping those on schedule. But we have to put them on the schedule for older systems. So, so the money is still needed. It's just we're going to have to redistribute that um, so that the dollars are really kind of bottom line still there. Okay, so um, here's a little chart that kind of shows you what the revenues – that's the red line with the squares. Um, the revenues are – if they if we just leave it alone, um, stays flat. And then the target reserves, and I'm really looking at the dashed um, lines there. The target reserves are what the council policy is for the two reserves that we currently have. Um, it follows the, the percentage of the operation and maintenance expenditures. So as you saw, see the bars going up, so does the actual amount required in the reserves. And if we do nothing, then the ending balance is that big black line that just kind of goes right down into the hole. So that's, uh, that's right now what's going to happen if we do nothing. Um, the financial uh, – some of the things to consider when we did the financial uh, – five-year financial plan is that uh, getting back to an early conversation was to answer um, Council Member Daigle's question was, was to actually take money from a loan, re uh, reduce the rate shock to our customers, and use reserves to actually smooth that out so we're not rate shocking the customers. And that was the guidance that we got from the Finance Committee. Um, the increased monthly service charge. Uh, we didn't just go after the commodity. We actually analyzed our per meter charge, and we t spent a lot of time on this. Currently, only 10 percent of the revenue that we collect is from our fixed fees. That's the cost of just the regular meter service. Typically, what you see that cost for is the operation and maintenance of, of the water system. 
the commodity, the, the variable portion that you pay per gallon of water, is typically used for what you pay for water. But unfortunately, only 10 percent of, of our revenue comes is the fixed fee. So we want to increase that to 30 percent. We spent a lot of time and looked at the logic and, and per Prop 218 justified how we got there. And you'll see later in, in our rate, proposed rate, um, why we went up there. It, it increases the revenue stability. Um, this is, again, another issue similar to what MET had, is if you put all your eggs into how much you sell water and then you reduce the sale of water, obviously your revenue drops. So to increase rate stability, we're not collecting 100 percent of our O&M costs, but we want to increase it to 30 percent. Um, so uh, that just kind of keeps our revenue a little bit more stable so we can operate the system and, and, um, and run it. This is the proposed financial plan from Red Oak Consulting. Um, again, there's a hundred slides behind this one that how we got here. But the revenues increase, they're above what the expenditures are, and that again is to refill. You can see the target reserves are, is that the orange dash line. I don't think this has a pointer. Um, but the, um, you can see the ending balance, the black one now is curving upwards, and that's what I was saying earlier, that instead of filling it the first year, we would actually take five years to refill the, 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 uh, the reserves. And so that's why you see the, the revenues going up. It's a good plan. It's, uh, we like it, and it was pretty, pretty easy to do. Okay, so uh, this is that fixed fee, the commodity charges at the top. Um, commodity is the $2.08. That's how much you pay for a 100 cubic foot of water. Uh, it's 748 gallons. Um, that the current year is 2009, uh, is, is 208. And then that, the size is the three-quarter to eight inches, the size of the meter. Um, that's the fixed fee per month. Um, and so next year, you can see how it's slowly going up. Rather than doing it all in one year, you see us going from 208 to 217, the three-quarter inch meter going from 450 a month to 563. And of course, it gets larger as the meters get larger. Now, this is something we didn't do in the past, but the thought behind this is really twofold. One, it follows an AWWA standard, which is American Water Works. It's something that all other agencies do. And two, if a three-quarter inch meter serves X amount of gallons, and a one-inch meter serves twice as much, the person that owns a one-inch meter should pay twice as much as the person with three-quarter. Now, people think, well, maybe that's not fair. But think about it. The infrastructure behind it to bring the water to that meter, if you're a large commercial account and you need a four-inch meter, the water lines and the pipelines and the pressure and the pump stations and everything it takes to bring water to feed enough water to that fire meter that's four inches is a lot greater than it is to connect to a three-quarter-inch house meter. So the infrastructure behind it costs more, and so that's why the costs go up as the meter sizes go up. Now, they're a lot more drastic because the existing charge, as you can see right now, is $45. It's less than 10 for an 8-inch meter. So that's less than 10 times what um, the 3 quarter inch, but yet the, the infrastructure behind it is huge. So we, we did a lot of work on that, and, and this is the industry standard, and this is um, what we took to the Finance Committee. So again, there's a few slides behind this one that how we got here. George, as I recall, one of those slides was how many <clears throat> customers oh. are served by three-quarter inch. This one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this is a good slide. Um, what this basically looks at is the single-family residential, and this is the three-quarter inch meter, and it's and it's a bill impact. So if we were to use those rates, um, the blue bars going uh, up and down are the dollar amount. So that's the first big tall blue line is $2. So if we were to raise the rates uh, by our current, the, the recommended structure, is that we, 23 percent of the customers would receive a $2 increase. And as you see, then it goes down to 22 percent uh, would receive a $3 increase and so on, um, all the way down to the big box there says that let's look at no more than $5. That line there looks at the a, kind of an overall, everybody included, 70 percent of all the customers that own a single-family home will, no, will not see an increase greater than $5. And I know it's a little bit complicated there, but there, sure. It's just for one year, I noticed that when you get out for yes. five years, you have quadrupled. That's. Okay, it's gone from uh, $5 to $18. That's correct. Okay. Yes. The first year will be the $5, and then the next year it continues to go up. If we put the full 40 percent on there, then they would see more. But I think the point was, based on the consumption, that 
over 70% of the folks would see a $5, and you're right, this is only three quarter inch meter as well. So if you look at the irrigation customers that are, have two inch and greater meters, they'll see a larger increase. But next year, you're right, over the next five years, um, they would continue to see that increase. So that's five, but it's $5 per month is what, is what, the, what the probability there. If you go a little bit higher, 90% of the, of the folks are going to see maybe a $9 uh, increase. You know more than nine, or it's basically, uh, you can see how it kind of works there. As you get on further uh, to the right of the chart, there are a few folks that uh, may, see, there's one customer I think that will see a $21 increase, but we don't, I think we're, that's a little dirt in the, in the data. Um, I don't know how that got there or who that is exactly, but obviously it's someone wasting water. But the majority of the customers are just going to see a slight increase. And I think we just wanted to see what the bill impact was for the first year. We could do it every year and see overall. Um, Sanjay's here from Red Oak. This is kind of a cool little this slide. Um, this is a, a slide that was created at a request of the Finance Committee, and they wanted to see, well, how do we compare apples to apples to everyone else? This one, what we did is there's two slides. One includes a capital charge and one does not. And the reason we separated it out is we wanted to see that capital improvement charge is collected by many agencies a lot different than us. Um, so to keep it all kind of fair, we're talking about just the fixed meter charge and the commodity rate. And so this slide currently, the way it sits now, is showing a consumption, an average consumption of 1,800 cubic foot um, and a three-quarter inch meter. And I don't know if everybody can see it, but the current rate on the left, you can see it actually goes down, our Newport Beach proposed. Because of our fixed fee, we're going to actually increase the fix, but we're going to lower our commodity. The next slide, we actually include all of that. We include the CIP, so you'll see it. Um, but we're going to be a little bit higher than Anaheim, about the same as IRWD, cheaper than Laguna, and so on and so on. As you change the number, you want to try that? as you change the commodity, one of the touchy things with IRWD is they use a tiered rate. Um, uh, did you get it? Yeah. Um, as you go up in the number, what happens is you see um, a change. Did not go? Uh, we probably locked it up. Oh, there it goes. Okay, IRWD uses a tiered rate structure, and, and that would be assuming that they had an allocation of 18. It's really hard to track theirs. If they had an allocation of 18, that's what their monthly bill would be uh, with a three quarter inch meter because they'd have been in a penalty range. So. If that customer, for some reason, had an allocation of 25, you would see IRWD's bar a lot lower. So I did want to, I did want to point that out. But Laguna, Huntington Beach, Mesa, Consolidated Water District, Garden Grove, um, all those folks have a similar rate structure to us. And you can see, even at the higher rates, um, we're right about the same, pretty, pretty average. Uh, why is Anaheim's water so much cheaper than everybody else's? Everybody wants to know. Um, no, Anaheim, uh, they actually, most all their wells exist right in their city. They're primarily on well water. And we don't, they don't have that pumping cost that we do. So when they pump it out of the ground, it goes right into their pipelines. They have a great, great system. It's also huge. Um, their customer base is really enormous. So if they charge $5 per customer, which is the mass quantities of residents, they collect on a lot on their fixed fee. So, well, but this is, this is not the fixed fee. This is the water rate. The right. per meter, the per meter charge. Oh, this we, is, this per is including per meter. I think when I say there is a capital improvement charge, that CIP charge, uh -huh. um, because the infrastructure repairs are different with, amongst the city, we took it out of this chart. But everybody pays that per meter charge, the service fee and the commodity. But that's not reflected up here. Yeah, yeah, this one is. It this is does right. include, I'm sorry, CIP is capital improvement programs, right. and those are separated out in this slide. And that's because uh, what we did that for is because the IRWD collects it on bonds and, and taxes, and it was hard for us to get a handle on that number and compare it to what we charge in our rate. Now, you're, you're right. We collect our CIP is funded currently out of our fixed charges. In the new proposed rate, we actually are going to roll that CIP um, expenditure into the fixed meter charge. And so we actually can we could split that chart. We didn't want to confuse it, but split the chart apart a little bit more and, and know exactly how so much it's going So Anaheim is drawing the same percentage from the underground aquifer as we are. Mm -hmm. You're just saying it's cheaper for them to get it into their pipes because it's not traveling 
10 miles or whatever? Yeah, we spent about a million and a half dollars in electricity alone just to bring um, water from Fountain Valley from to Fountain here, Valley. and that's just for one lift. If we were, when we pump it again into the distribution system and use our reservoir and we treat it, um, it costs a, a significant amount more. Plus we lease the water, the well line that goes up to Fountain Valley. Uh, and then the mass quantity of that four times the amount of residents, so then they'll be able to collect quite a bit more money just in fixed fees alone. So there's a difference, but you're right. That that is the actual cost. Well, assuming they, they have more. four times more pipes going around, and I mean, but if, yeah, their infrastructure should yeah. be more. I mean, the city is a little more dense maybe than Newport Beach is. So, George, can I assume looking at that chart mm -hmm. that IRWD Laguna and, and Mesa have tiered water rates then? No, ju just IRWD. The only other tiered rate structure that is out there is the city of San Juan Capistrano. We can lower, again, that's, and I did want to quantify that looking at IRWD there, is that the model was built based on a, a person had an allocation of 1,700 cubic foot. And, and as they use a little bit more in a tiered rate structure, they start going into penalty rates. And so when we build the model, we have to pick which, which number are we really going to use. Um, we built it. So you could look at, compare it to all other agencies, but in IRWD's case, it's built on, a, I don't wanted to quantify that, that it's built on the 1,800 cubic foot. This would show if, you, if somebody used that much water, which I believe, what's well, 25 there currently, is that that's how much you would pay in IRWD. But um, Laguna, that is how much you pay. That's the exact same structure we have. Anaheim, you're right, it's much lower. Um, we'll go to the next. Uh, let's see what happened. Oh, there you go. Okay, this, this one has the fix and the variable portion of the actual bill. Um, the fix is that per meter charge. It does include CIP, and that's the variable um, portion. That's the how much we charge, the 208, uh, the how much that's the per gallon of uh, cost. And uh, in this one, again, we're using a three-quarter inch single family home, three-quarter inch at 1,800 cubic. 1,800 cubic foot. And you can see with our fixed fees increasing, now our proposed is a little bit higher than our current. Uh, I, Anaheim is still low. Um, Laguna is still high. Um, so, but we're kind of in the middle of the range there. Now we can change, I don't know if you want to change the numbers on this one, but you can see how it affects. It goes, it does change based on how what your consumption is. If we took that one to 25 on this one, you would see, see a similar result. Uh, okay. Just a quick question, sir. Just so I know, we're comparing apples to apples. I mean, uh, you referred uh, just a few minutes ago to the fact that we have a very good program mm -hmm. of maintaining and upgrading our system. How does that compare to the other cities, like Garden Grove, for instance, or even Anaheim or those places? I mean, do they have a similar type of a maintenance and repair? Or are they, yeah. you know, where we have 30 years on a the line, they, they have 40 years on a line or something? or? Yeah, it's kind of interesting how that where Newer cities, of course, never got the cast iron and redwood mains that Newport Beach does. Newport Beach is quite a bit older, so we've, we've done that. We've had to keep up and put a lot of effort into that. Um, and Yes, other cities do. You're right. They have a quite a bit more pipeline. I think uh, Long Beach has 800 miles of pipeline, and it may be a specific cement pipe which lasted a long time. So everybody's after getting the cast iron mains out of their, their water system. They seem like a great idea back in the 40s and the 50s. However, one, they break, and two, they get rusty. And, you know, back then you just put fires out. They didn't care if it looked a little orange, but now people don't like their clothes to be orange. So we get rid of the cast iron main, and everybody's object or everybody's goal is to get rid of that cast iron main, and it's very costly. Newport, we have less. Steve probably knows the number, but I, I'm sure it's less, way less than 5% of our pipeline, 10% of our pipeline is still cast iron. There's very little bit. And a lot of it's in our bay crossings. That's the stuff that's under the bay. The, our structure is a lot different than other cities. Anaheim doesn't have the bay crossings like we do. Uh, they're not built in the sand, you know. They're, they're not in the salt water like we do. So I think everybody's CIP is a little bit different. Their uh, I guess maybe you're not exactly hitting the nail on the head on my question. Okay. I'm, I'm, I guess what I want to know is, I mean, there's different levels of maintenance and, and, and quality of, of pipes and pumps and systems and backups and things like that. You know, would you say that all the water systems in the county have a similar level or some are kind of cheating a little, you know, or not putting the kind of money in that they should, or maybe they're putting in more money than we are. I mean, we're behind, you know, what we should be doing. I just want to get a feel for our, um, qualitatively, do we have a better system, uh, equal system or worse system than most other cities in the county? 
When you, when you mention money, really, if I look percentage-wise, maybe this explains it as well. 10% of the contribution, 10% of our revenue or expenditure is invested in our CIP. 10% of the $17 million is invested in CIP, and that's what we've done. That 10% is actually, um, it's not the highest. I mean, you see a lot of people putting in much higher than that. So 20% is a reasonable amount, and I think that's how agencies look at that. Is how much are there? How much can they afford per per year to put into it? So we're about 15 to 20 percent right now, which I think is fair. As far as reliability, I think it's the best, and of course that's because I'm. Well, that's what I was saying. I guess but, are, is it costing more because we're getting more? I mean, well, I think le less problems, less breaks, less or quicker repairs, or are we basically on par with everybody else? I think we're on par with everyone else. I think costing more is one we needed to invest in the groundwater project, which we did, and we had the bond, as you see, is getting paid off. The Big Canyon Reservoir cover, which was another huge expense, was important because the State Health Department, and we had an open reservoir, so that was important. The CIP, again, at Public Works has done a great job with an aggressive um, program to replace that. Um, are we getting the breaks? No, I think we have a more reliable system. The earth shook the other night at 4.8. Uh, we had no breaks. We sent everybody everywhere. We checked every bridge, and we went everywhere there could be and didn't find one break, which is a good sign that we have a good, stable infrastructure in place, and we want to keep it that way. There are projects like underground districts where we take the, under, the opportunity when we have the alley torn up to put in the new pipelines. And so I think that it's right on par with everyone else. 10 to 15 percent of our uh, operation expenditures reinvested into the system to change out those 50-year-old pipelines. I think is a reasonable, that's a number that everybody uses. Okay. Thank you, George. George, I do think that the city of Huntington Beach, the last time I heard that they have uh, like hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, utility lines that they feel like are need to be replaced in, in the pretty near future. And I think it kind of compares what city. I mean, you look at large cities like L.A., New York, and some of these other ones where, the, where they just can't afford to keep up. You know, it, they're going to break, and that's why you see those main breaks. Um, the older cities, it depends on the age of city. Irvine City has fairly new infrastructure, so you don't see the breaks that you do here in the older cities. So, um, And then Yorba Linda, if, if you recall, one of the issues was the fires uh, were hard to control because the infrastructure had failed. Uh, once they started flowing and slamming fire hydrants, you know, lines started breaking. And so we don't want that here in Newport. So we look at the age of the pipe, the age of the structure, and we put it on a plan similar to what you're doing with your facilities master plan and saying you're going to have to reinvest invest in that system to maintain a good, reliable system. So um, that, that's really how we base that. Okay, um, moving on. This is what happens uh, after – now, we, I gave you some brief slides on what the water rates or what our proposed rates are based on the, um, the study. And we'll, we'll, at the time that we go to the next phase, we would like to bring back the exact details or anything that you want to know, the details uh, behind the proposed rate, um, so we can get into any depth that you would like. But one of the things I wanted to mention is the Proposition 218. Now, California voters, um, they had um, approved the Proposition 218 in 1996, although at the time um, water and wastewater fees were exempt. It was amended in 2006. So water and wastewater fees um, are related, so then there are procedures that needed to be followed. If you recall earlier in a slide, the last time we raised the rates was in 2005. So that means things are different when we raise the rates. Um, I put in your handout, it actually said, I changed it. It's rate adoption, requires a 45-day notice. Once we bring the procedure to you and the rates to you and you approve the rates, then there is a 45-day waiting period there where folks have an opportunity to write uh, to protest that uh, rate increase. If 51 percent of the residents decide they don't want the rate to go up, um, then we can't raise the rates. So 51 percent of residents or I'm sorry, 51 percent of what? It's actually property owners. And, and even to further define <laughs> that, which I'll bring to you at the next council meeting, there are procedures that need to be put in place on how you tabulate and count those votes. Okay. So let's say you have 40,000 property owners, 50,000 property owners. 25,001 have to vote no? Correct. Okay. And it gets even more detailed where if there are two property owners for one property, only one vote is, is counted. Even if there, you know, one votes yes, one votes no, you still count the one no. So those procedures I'll have before you next at the next council meeting. 
and they're clear. We actually had outside council draw those up, and so I have the procedures ready to go and to notify the public. So, given the apathy that's in, you know, consistent in elections, is is one of these ever failed? It's only failed in very, very small communities, like literally 5,000 property owners. Yeah, it, on on most cities, no, it has not. And I think the thing is to get the message out there. We're here today. We'll be here again at council. And then we'll, when we send that notice out, we clearly explain what the rates and how we're raising them and justifying them. And then this second step, um, which I think I – maybe it's in my next slide – is that we, when we adopt these procedures on how um, rates are to be – water and sewer rates are to be raised and what the rights are of the resident, we're going to actually take that step to you and have you look at – a resolution to adopt those procedures so everybody knows about it. This is the first time for the city of Newport Beach that we've raised them, so. Um. Okay, well, I would probably have a list to submit to you. I think we need to be Great. very transparent about what the costs are. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the, um, after, if council should um, decide to raise the rates, rates, then we would have a 45-day um, notice period, and then we would have the last uh, public hearing uh, if there is no majority protest, then um, it could be adopted by ordinance. And again, that, that follows the 30-day process after that. So we're looking at 30, about three months from start to finish if we choose to raise the rates. Um, at the, the last bullet on here was the recommendation to adopt procedures consistent with Prop 218. That's the thing that I told you that I bring to you next council meeting. And those are the actual procedures. It's not required by law to do that, but we thought we would put that in front of you. And so we can actually look at those procedures. So those questions on who who can vote and who can't and how many and what, that we would just define that in our next um, by resolution. Um, and then so the last thing um, was on the water conservation. And the reason I threw this slide up there really has nothing to do with rates, but it also uh, I think people would ask, well, look, if rates are going up and there's a big water shortage, what is the city doing? And so we came to the Coastal Bay Water Quality um, meeting last month, and there's a new conservation ordinance, which will be in front of you next council meeting as well. And it completely replaces our existing conservation ordinance. And I think conservation efforts are something that's important so to help keep our rates lower and to keep uh, – because the, the supply is uh, diminishing. So um, I'll have this in front of your, you uh, next, next council meeting. But uh, the imposed restrictions on local groundwater, uh, again, that's because the basin pumping percentage is, is dropping, uh, the delta issue of Northern California. Uh, Future funding is ordinance dependent. This is something that was mandatory. Um, the, any grant monies or any funding from MODOC and MET would be um, taken away if we didn't pass this ordinance. Um, so again, I'll, uh, you'll see that next, next council meeting. So other than that, I know it's a quick run through on there. We'd be happy to bring back the details when we, when we ask you about um, increasing the rates and when we can issue the notice, but um, I'm open for any questions. I know it's a lot of lot of stuff in a short period of time. You know, it's quick. I'd hate to see the long version. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, any questions? Um, I guess I have one. What's, okay. what's the alternative to raising the rates, or are there none? Well, again, if, as you saw the ending balance, uh, the reserves will, will – and, and then the next step would be is to cut back. We have to buy the water to bring it into Newport, so that's one cost. We've already trimmed back this year on all op, um, of the operation and maintenance costs that we could. Uh, the next would be, I guess, employee layoffs. And then I guess, uh, but that you just can't recover enough money when we're looking at a, a 4 or $5 million increase in, in cost of water. Um, I'm not sure how you could recover all those. So. You could. Uh, yeah, the, the initial thought was that we would take a general fund loan, which was what the first thought was, but that would only last. They were talking millions of dollars. So as uh, Council Member Webb said, the only option is we can turn off the water, um, but I don't know how popular that would be. So. <laughs> but. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, we will continue with uh, the rest of the um, items uh, listed in your uh, study session agenda at the uh, next study session, but are there any questions or any issues in looking at the, uh, the PowerPoints from the departments that you'd like for us to be prepared for? Okay. Is there anything anyone wants to bring up right now on departmental issues? That's I, I, do, I do have a few questions, but I'd just as soon uh, send them to you and okay. let you, give you a chance to respond. So. Good. 
We all do the same in the interest of time. Okay. Is that? I'll get that. Is there anything else? That's no. It? Well, that's it. Okay. Public comments on the budget. Okay. No public comments on the budget. Any public comments on non-agenda items? Okay. Seeing none, we'll adjourn to closed session. Mr. Mayor, may I just make one announcement prior to adjourning to closed session? I would just note that our closed session agenda, we inadvertently placed a real property negotiations on the closed session agenda as Roman numeral two, capital C. That will not be discussed in closed session. It was an error on our part. It's premature. Okay.